Good morning and welcome to First Press. I am Bo Mircha, associate pastor here at First, and I am so glad that you jo uh, you're joining us today. The psalmist says, My heart is glad when they tell me, let us go and worship the Lord in the temple. Let us go and, and be together in God's presence. And there, that joy, it's something that we share on this day. It's a joy that God gives us from His presence. It's the joy that transforms us and gives us hope. So I am glad that you're here. Let us go and worship. The Lord is with you. My friends, let's take a moment to just breathe deeply, to drink in the presence of God, to be still and know. Listen to the silence. God is here. Take just a moment and reflect on all that God has done for you, for your family, for this church. Respond with prayer and with thanksgiving. My friends, let's worship God together. Will you please bow your head? Prince of Peace, we need you. Our world needs you. Your church needs you. We hear your word calling us to remain faithful and hopeful when so many signs around us point to despair. Our world seems intent on blowing itself apart. Anger begets hatred, which begets violence, which begets more violence. Innocents are slaughtered, lives are upended, and our peace is shattered yet again. Still, you call us. Still, you whisper our names. Still, you invite us to stand in the gap, to speak up for those who have lost their voices, to name and resist injustice, to tell the truth in love. Meet us in our worship this day, O God, that we might listen once again for your voice and for the words of peace you speak to our lives and our hearts. Amen.
the kids come and join me? So this morning, when I got to church, I said to myself, you know what, there's a place I really miss being around. There is a place that has so many good memories, so many good things. So I decided to come in our classroom here. And guess what? The Bibles are right there on the table waiting for us. We got books and everything else just waiting to be used, right? And then we got all our storytelling. And we have all this place that has so many good memories for us. And in one way, I kind of felt, hmm. But at the same time, I also felt, yeah. You know why? Because I have faith that one day we'll be back together here. And that's what I want to talk to you today. I want to talk to you about faith. What is faith? You see, people see faith as trust. You see, we all have faith, right? We all trust so many things. Like, for example, we trust our parents. We have faith in our parents that they will take care of us. We trust our teachers. We trust so many things. But today there's some type of different uh, trust I wanted to talk to you about. And I went and found my buddy Moses. He was hiding here by the kangaroos. Well, Moses, he was the type of person that had faith, but not really big faith. Okay? I know it's a little confusing, but stay with me. So Moses is walking through the desert, and he sees a burning bush. And God speaks to him and says, I want you to follow me, and I want you to go and set my people free from Egypt. Now Moses, if you remember, he used to be a prince of, in Egypt, and he knew how cruel the Egyptians can be. So he was a little afraid. So he says to God, if you are really God, you are going to help me through this. And not only help me, but you're going to give me a tool to, to help me with this. So God says to Moses, you see the staff you have in your hand? Throw it to the ground, and it will turn into a serpent. And as you pick it up from the tail, it will turn back into, a, into the staff. You see, all of us need sometimes a little sign from God. A little sign that tells us God loves us and God is with us and God gives us faith. Sometimes we start with very little faith and that faith grows. And that is very important for us to remember. How to grow our faith. So, for today, I want to ask you to talk to your parents, your grandparents, your friends about what makes things grow. And even more, what makes your faith grow? So I hope you have an awesome day and an awesome week. And I will see you next week. Take care. For community updates today, I want to do something different. Just different. <laughs> it's, uh, I want to stop and pause and talk to you about everything that's going on at First Press. Every, so many things are happening. You know, we meet on Sunday morning and we worship together on Sunday morning. And it's amazing to see people coming for worship. But even more, to see the people that, um, that come and set and participate in worship. You know, between uh, Beth playing the organ, uh, Holly singing, the worship band, and the greeters, and everything that's happening. It's such a good feel to it, but even, even more, it's, it's a reminder that God's love reigns in our hearts, even in, in, in difficult times. Last week, I was reminded of love and joy as people came through and uh, drove through uh, our little Bible Sunday uh, rally day and they got to see the youth advisor they they came to donate things to bags of love and thank you thank you for watching uh, uh, 
the, the Sunday worship video and then responding right away. I know that some of you saw the, visit, the video and said, I have to get up to church and donate some things for Bags of Love. So thank you for, for doing that. As I was uh, in the parking lot last week and I was greeting people and it was so good to see little faces, you know, that uh, we miss uh, at church and uh, see the big joy for them to receive a Bible or to receive those uh, little treats that we have for them. Those are the things that make First Press at this time really a place of hope, a really a place where we see God at work. So I want to encourage you to take that joy, take that commitment to, 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 to the work of God, wherever you are. You know, at work, at school, um, as you uh, talk to your friends, talk and let that joy be shared. Because we surely know that we need hope, we need joy at this time. And God will give us that. But we have to look in on all the right places. So, looking forward to hear some of your stories if you want to share them with me about how God is present in your life. You have an awesome week. Take care. life, open up your word to us in scripture so that we may see our world, our community, and ourselves as you intend. Grace us with your understanding, wisdom, and hope as we study the scriptures together today. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in of, of an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. 
And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God has given us the gift of reconciliation to himself in the gift of Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for us and reigns in power for us and prays for us. So now let us give our gifts of our lives, our tithes and our offerings to fund the ministry of Jesus Christ here in the church, in the community, and in the world. There are a number of ways that we can give. The First Presbyterian Church, we can give by mail. We can give online on the church website using the Give tab. We can give through electronic giving by setting that up with our treasurer, Tracy Norris. Or we can give in person if we come and worship in our live worship services. So let us give thanks to God for the gift of reconciliation to himself in and through Christ Jesus by what we give uh, this day and this week. Lord, take our offerings, use them to your glory, your honor, to share the good and wonderful news of Jesus Christ in word and deed this day and always. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us continue our worship.
I invite you now to give faithful attention to the reading of God's word here. First Timothy chapter six, beginning with the verse number two, ending with the verse number 10. We find practical instructions for how God's people should live and be the church. These are the things you should teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. May God bless us as we seek to understand the scriptures, his word to us, and worship together. What is taught in the university has a way of eventually influencing what plays out in the streets of our society. I think of social media, for example. Google was started by two Stanford University students, and now it is a huge, huge corporation. Facebook was started by Mark Zuckerberg while he was in Harvard at college. And now it is worldwide. It's everywhere. What is taught in the university plays out in the streets. And what happens in the streets filters into the sanctuary. What occurs in the culture enters the church. This has been true for centuries, and we see it right here in 1 Timothy in Ephesus. We find the Greco-Roman culture going throughout the world, crossing over the Aegean Sea into the city of Ephesus, entering the church. And in our particular case, we're going to look at some of the problems that created False teachers are entering the church more and more, and they do not possess true godliness with contentment, which is of utmost value. Instead, they are interested in their own self-aggrandizement and financial gain. You see, in Rome and Greece, wandering teachers were prominent. They were called sophists, wise men. And the growth of Christian churches in city after city offered wandering teachers and prophets new opportunities which they were not slow to take on. Now, in the Greco-Roman society, the best teachers, the best wise men, were highly esteemed and sought after, and they made a lot of money. They made it their business to teach people how to speak well and to argue cleverly, all for a fee. They turned philosophy and teaching and religion into a way of becoming rich and well-to-do. Now the best, the most famous, who wandered from town to town were able to draw a thousand people to their lectures. They would offer to speak on any subject, no matter how remote, no matter how obtuse it was. And they would seek to argue and out-debate anyone who dared come forward, and they organized argument contests. Their thirst for applause in large crowds was unending. Some went on to become senators and governors and ambassadors. People in the Greco-Roman world were intoxicated with the spoken word. So if a person could really speak, their fortune was made. It's within this particular cultural context that the early church was growing and expanding, and so false teachers began to enter the churches. And in Ephesus, they were particularly present, and they were very disruptive. And we read of the characteristics of these false teachers in this passage that Paul writes to young Timothy. The first trait we see is conceit. Their aim is self-display. Their desire is not to display Christ, but to display themselves. The goal was to press their own views upon people instead of bringing the word and person of Christ to the people. Perhaps you heard the joke or the quip about PR people. 
The pessimist says the cup is half empty. The optimist says, no, the cup is half full. While the PR person says, hey, hurry up and get a bucket. This cup is just overflowing. And the false teachers were like that. They were concerned with exaggeration and speculation and argument rather than life in Christ. They were disturbers of the peace as they were instinctively suspicious of anyone and everyone who differed from their point of view. They majored in malicious talk and strife. And finally, if that were not enough, they commercialized the faith. They were always interested in profits. And we'll come back to that profit motive in a few minutes. But first, let's focus on the contentiousness that they created in Ephesus. They used tantalizing teaching instead of the truth of Christ. They used seductive words rather than the sound instruction of Jesus for the people. And this was extremely disruptive and corrosive. And we can see that dynamic of contentiousness in our culture today. For we are enmeshed in the stormy seas of a cascading confrontational politic. I'm right, you're wrong. I'm on the good side, you're on the bad side. In fact, you're evil. Everything is this or that, very simply. Your positions and candidate will bring the end of our world, and both sides are saying that to one another. Your thoughts and policies are our worst nightmares. And studies, sociological and psychological studies, show right now that too many people are ending friendships and cutting off family members with whom they disagree, who they know are going to vote for a different candidate. And those who are well-versed in conflict and in building relationships and providing reconciliation say this is when people really need to talk and to listen but they are not. We need more conversations to understand rather than to condemn and push away. And as all of this divisiveness continues, people think the worst of the other side in their minds. In their minds, they develop the worst possible scenarios of what they think of all those people with whom they disagree. Back and forth it goes. But remember, this is the United States of America, and people are free to vote as they so determine, and they will do that. In this conflagration of contentiousness, we find that the ends justify the means. We are headed for worse things if all this strife continues, for hatred cannot cast out hatred. Hatred is simply not a solid foundation, a good foundation for anything that is good. The means are the ends, are the ends in process. Hatred is not a good means. Professionals who monitor third world elections and see discord and warfare and argument say they are seeing some of the same kinds of characteristics bubbling up in our culture. And the thought is that this could lead to violence no matter which side wins the election. I heard just this Thursday that more and more companies are purchasing more insurance for their properties against violence and rioting. As followers of Jesus Christ, it is not, it is not our mandate to manufacture and increase the quota of malevolence and strife in our world. It is not our mission to magnify malicious talk. It is not our calling to create constant friction between people. Godliness is not a measure, a means to spread evil suspicions. So if we were on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or social media, it's not an excuse to be ugly Christians in this time. To be ugly Christians by what we write, text, portray, and put on video. So please... If you are spouting ugliness and judgmental and caustic statements on social media, please stop doing that. If you are writing and saying things to others that you would never, ever say to them face to face, please, please don't tell anyone you are a follower of Jesus. Please don't talk about your faith in going to church. Please don't mention First Presbyterian Church. I'm not saying that you can 
not have a disagreement or an argument or a discussion with others, but we should disagree and argue and discuss in love and with care for the other person in mind because we are followers of Christ. Yesterday, a community leader said to me, you know, people are on such a short fuse now. You have to be so very, very careful what you say and how you say it and what not to say. You know, some people in the church have the form of godliness, but not the real substance. Jesus said, by your fruit, you will know them. And aren't our lives, he said, supposed to be a platform for Jesus Christ above all, for Christ's grace? Think about what Paul himself wrote to the church in Ephesus. He wrote these words before he wrote to Timothy. He wrote these words in the book of Ephesians. He must have known that there were some struggles there. And so Paul wrote, Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The church is not intended to be a source of strife, constant friction, or malicious talk within the church or into the world. God's love, grace, forgiveness, and hope in and through the Lord Jesus Christ should always be at the center of our lives. Our lives are supposed to be a platform for the person of Jesus Christ so that Christ can work in and through us and that when others see us, they see something more of who Jesus truly is. And so we are called to counteract contentious strife, constant friction, controversies, and quarrels. We are to live into contentment, contentment in Christ. At the very center of our passage we read this morning, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul wrote about godliness with contentment in other places. Paul was able to write about contentment when he was in prison, writing to the Philippian church. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances, he wrote. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Finding contentment in Christ Jesus rather than in controversy and contentiousness is key. And that brings us back to the point about riches. Finding contentment in Christ Jesus rather than an insatiable desire for riches and possessions is so very important in life. And the false teachers were not only promoting contentiousness, the false teachers were also about using their platform for profit. They had an insatiable desire to get rich. They had an overwhelming desire to get rich by spinning words. They were spin doctors and not humble truth tellers of Christ in the church. And Paul reminds the followers of Jesus, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we shall be content with that. And you know, When we think about it, the only thing that a person can take out of life into the world beyond is herself or himself, their character. It is right when they say there are no pockets in a shroud. True contentment is not about collecting possessions. Max Licato said it so well. He said, if your happiness comes from some, something that you deposit, drive, drink, or digest, then face it, you are in prison, the prison of want. If we feel better when we have more and worse when we have less, the waves of want are winning, then we are drowning in discontent. Your stuff isn't your stuff. Ask any coroner, ask any embalmer, ask any funeral home director. No one takes anything with them. 
When one of the wealthiest men in all of history, John D. Rockefeller, was asked how much is enough, he said just a little bit more. He wanted just a little bit more always. And when John D. Rockefeller died, his accountant was asked, how much did John D. leave behind? The accountant's reply, all of it. All of it. And I would add the same will be true of Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, and you and me. Yet it is our character that we carry with us to the next life. And of course, when we come face to face with Jesus, we are all hoping to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Paul writes, those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's not the root, the only root of all kinds of evil. It is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with so many griefs. But godliness with contentment is great gain. I think Paul must have read that little short prayer in Proverbs 30, just two verses long. Oh God, I beg you, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Contentment is about relationships, not riches. Those who are rich in relationships, I have found, are most content They have a relationship with the living God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who said, I no longer call you servant, but I have called you friend. And they have relationships with people whom they love, their neighbors, family, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are in need. And we are called to even love our enemies. Contentment has to do with right relationships with God and with others. Lou Holtz in a commencement speech once said, if you want to be happy for an hour, eat a steak. If you want to be happy for a day, play golf. If you want to be happy for a week, go on a cruise. If you want to be happy for a month, buy a new car. For a year, win the lottery. But if you want to be happy for a lifetime, put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ the good shepherd. That's it. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Please pray with me. Lord, we pray this day and each day that we might know true contentment. The contentment that lasts forever because it's rooted in Christ Jesus. So remind us that we can do all things. We can face all situations, even 2020, through Christ Jesus, who strengthens us. Guide and direct us this day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us continue to worship our God as we sing and prepare to come to the Lord's table to break bread and drink from the cup. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more with the true and living bread. Ever let our souls be fed. Bread of heaven, Vine of heaven, fill me till I want no more. To thy cross I look and live. Lord, thy wounded healing give. 
final heaven. Day by day our strength supplied through the life of him who died. Lord of life, oh, let it be rooted, grounded, built on thee. Bread of heaven. Lord of heaven, may we love you more and more as we take this bread and wine. In these moments may we find bread of heaven. Day by day our strength supplied through the life of him who died. Lord of life, oh, let it be rooted, grounded, built on thee, bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more with thy true and living bread. Ever let our souls be fed, bread of heaven, bread of heaven, bread of heaven. We come to this table with great hope. We come to this table because at this table, God is with us. So I want to encourage you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, you are the perfect sacrifice that God made so the world will be reconciled, that the world will become a new creation. And in that sacrifice, Lord, we find our hope and strength for every day. And as we are at the table as one people, as you prayed for us to be one, we continue to pray and lift our neighbor before you. Lift those that are in need of love and hope before you today. We pray, Lord, for the week ahead and for the months ahead that as people we can be one, united by the love of God and the love of our neighbor. So we pray, Lord, that you will soften the hearts of those that need softening. We pray, Lord, that you will give hope and love to those that need hope and love. As we are gathered around this table, we are reminded that we too are to be a sacrifice for many. So, Lord, give us your spirit to teach us how to sacrifice for those around us. At these tables, we are reminded there is forgiveness, there is healing, so, Lord, come into our lives with healing for our wounds, with healing for our souls, for our bodies. And we pray, Lord, for those that are suffering today, that need medical hope. We pray that their bodies are going to be strengthened and their bodies are going to find health. But more, we pray for hope and faith for them. We also pray for those that need forgiveness on this day, that they will be reminded that you are the fountain of love. So Lord, as your people, as your church, we come and bow before you, and we ask that once again, you will be with us, that you will send your spirit to revive us again and make us one. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We live in a time and an era of great discontent. And the discontent in our society becomes part of the fabric of our lives too. So come to this table where we can find true contentment in Christ. Jesus asks us to come into his presence. And we are reminded that we can face any situation, all situations, in Christ who strengthens us. 
Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary, all who are overburdened, and I will give you rest. So come to this table and rest in the presence of Jesus who welcomes us. On the night when our Lord Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together the bread of life. The gospel tells us that at the end of the night, as they were finishing their supper, Jesus took the cup, he blessed it, and poured it out, saying, This is the new covenant I'm making with you, a covenant in my, in my blood, my blood being shed for your forgiveness. So as we drink and remember Christ's sacrifice, let us remember his love and healing for us. Take and drink. Please pray with me. Wonderful, gracious God, we thank you for new life, for redeemed life, for forgiveness in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. We celebrate him. We celebrate you. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, making Christ present to us wherever we go. Lord, go with us into the world with great content in our hearts because we have been at table with the Lord Jesus and with one another. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And now let us continue our worship in song.